and that was the big, I think that was the big eye opener for me when I read this mm -hmm. study, I don't know, a couple days ago, and it wasn't a new study, but, um, yeah. you know, it was like, oh, well, this changed really dramatically, but then it wasn't like a permanent thing. I yeah. mean, it was, it went back. And so, yeah, it's, 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 it's almost like that you're saying with interventions, it's like, well, I mean, make sure you didn't get sick or like, you know, yeah, you weren't sick exactly. like too early before, you know, measuring. And, and we can talk about that in a little bit, um, a little bit later, but I kind of, to get sort of just back into the cause and effect of aging and, and if the epigenetic clock changes are really causal, I mean, of course, mm -hmm. you're obviously trying to figure that out. But even like, even if it was, let's say downstream of something, if it was biomarking mm -hmm. aging, what, like the epigenetic changes that are happening with aging, you kind of mentioned this early, early in the podcast about how, um, you know, they're, they're clustering in, in gene regu re regulatory regions. And so mm -hmm. they're changing the way genes are turned on or turned off. Like, is there like a feed forward loop in aging where it's like, okay, now these epigenetic changes are turning off genes that we want on to repair damage. And they're turning mm -hmm. on genes that are cellular senescence or, you know, yeah. so it's like accelerating this like feed forward loop. Is yeah. That, yeah, I mean, it's definitely possible. I think it's, yeah, it's really hard to figure out causality here, right? Like, and it could be that, you know, I, I mean, my my perspective is not there's a cause of aging, right? And, the, you know, there it's this thing, and once you fix that, everything else will go away. I mean, so many things go wrong, and your system can change. It can diverge in some, going back to kind of Mike Snyder saying, even if you bring that down to the molecular level, there's so many different ways that someone's system can kind of change over time and I don't think it's like you just need to it's just this one thing that's going to then drive all of aging um and yeah it, it this you know our systems are responsive right so one thing changes something else is going to respond and that can be maladaptive which would you know snowball things so yeah I think it's going to be hard to figure out like what's causal what's correlative but I would say even if it's not the what some people might consider the central driver, as long as it's picking up things that are critical to aging and you can use that to track aging or understand it a little bit better, I think it still has utility. I don't know if it needs to be kind of the central cause of aging for it to be useful. Right. Um, exactly. If you can if you can track it and or um, use it for basic science, you know, to understand mm -hmm. the processes better. Uh, but with some of these genes, like, I'm just curious, do they know, like, is, is, has research shown, your research and others shown that, like, you know, we, we are seeing as the epigenetic clock ages, we are seeing more um, genes that are regulating, like, NF-kappa B mm -hmm. turn on, you know, like, causing yeah. more inflammation. So it's not necessarily the cause of aging, but it's helping accelerate it when mm -hmm. you start to, as you start to accumulate these epigenetic changes, as they start to shift. Yeah. Yeah, so the hard thing has actually been looking at the genes that these CPGs are assigned to or that they co-locate with. Um, and actually, that's been a little bit less clear because the methylation patterns are not, as we might expect, correlating with the expression patterns. And there's a number of reasons that could be. It's because we're looking at lots of cells in a population. You need to look within an individual cell to actually be able to see this. Um, it could be you know, there are other epigenetic modifiers that could also be important in this, so it's not a one-to-one. -one. Um, but we can just look at general gene expression that epigenetic clocks are associated with, and, it, you know, it does seem, you can kind of find certain pathways that seem to be important, and some of these are inflammatory or other aging pathways that we'd kind of expect. But, yeah, we still don't know exactly what the CPGs that are in these clocks are functionally doing, um, even though we say, oh, I, I actually said it in the beginning of this talk, when you have methylation, it's repressive, when you don't, is it's active, but it, it seems like it's actually a lot more complicated, and one thing that I always come back to is I can make a clock out of a few hundred CPGs that are in, you know, they're in specific genes. I can remove all of those genes and remake a new clock, and I can get the same clock from a totally different set of genes. I don't know what that means in terms of understanding the functionality of what we're trying to capture, but I think it, it, it just suggests it's not as simple as, you know, these 20 genes are turned on and these 20 genes are turned off. Right, right. A lot, a lot more to, to learn. Um, epigenetic age reversal. Mm -hmm. 
Um, that's a big interest, of course. Um, and uh, there's been, I'm sort of curious about your, your recent, like some of your thoughts on some of the, there's been some recent studies. So we were talking about programming, mm -hmm. right? We were talking about, in a, in a way, right? With, with the developmental program and mm -hmm. this epigenetic clock sort of really tracking that yeah. really well, being part of that in some way connected. We don't really, I don't exactly understand yeah. why or I don't know if, if it's known, but. I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> okay, so. Um, some of this work with interrupted cellular reprogramming or the, the partial reprogramming, mm -hmm. as it's called. A lot of that work's come from uh, Juan Carlos Belmonte's group mm -hmm. where they can, um, they can it, maybe you can explain like yeah. what this is to people and um, how that affects epigenetic aging or what's known or not known. But yeah, so this really came out of um, work originally from Shinya Yamanaka who discovered what we call these Yamanaka factors, which are four transcription factors, we just call them OSKM, um, which when expressed, you can actually take a somatic, so a, an adult cell and convert it back into what looks like an embryonic stem cell. So we call these induced pluripotent stem cells. And then you can use those to make a number of different types of cells. But the interesting thing and why aging researchers got really invested in this science is that not only are you making it embryonic-like in terms of its stem cell properties, but the epigenetic clocks are seem to be almost completely reversed. And we've actually shown recently they're not completely reversed, but you can take a skin cell that has an epigenetic age of 40 and do this. It takes you know a, a few weeks to do and, and basically get back to an epigenetic age of zero in those cells. And and, and you keep it at the skin cell, it doesn't lose its identity? No, so it loses its identity. Okay, when you, when you in, yeah, back. so this full, um, this is considered kind of this full epigenetic reprogramming. And then what Juan Carlos Belmonte and others have done is look at this idea of partial reprogramming. So can we push the cell back a little bit? Because actually what we find is that this age reversal happens first, prior to the cell losing its identity. So can you do that part without pushing it all the way back what we consider up or down the landscape to this, this pluripotent stem cell. So can I just make an old skin cell a young skin cell, but it's still a skin cell. So that's the goal. Right. And, and with um, some of the recent work, at least out of his lab, um, they're using a premature aging mass model, a progeria model, and have shown, I know there's a new publication I haven't read, just came out, but yeah. the older one, the, fir the first one, 2016 or something, mm -hmm. um, cell paper, I remember, they, they, they showed in, in multiple different organs, it seemed to, to reverse some of the hallmarks of aging, mm -hmm. you know, and the organs were performing functionally a little bit, you know, yeah. younger than you would imagine, and at least in this premature aging mo mouse model, and I think even health span of, mm -hmm. of this mouse model that's prematurely aging, it seemed to be improved. I mean, what that means for humans that are not mice with yeah. prematuring aging syndromes yeah. was to be determined, but um, but the epigenetic clock also was was also reversed as well, right? In, yeah, in and that. I think the new publication, which is done in more of a wild type, not a progerioid mice, mouse does show kind of some reversal of the epigenetic clock. And, and you can do this just cells in a dish. We can partially reprogram them and show reversal of epigenetic clock um, and other functional improvements in the cells. So to you, what does that mean, like, that you can do that? Yeah. Like, no, I mean, I think this is the most fascinating thing. Again, I don't know in terms of translation, like actually making this a therapeutic, and I don't even think people were at the point where Basic we're science. speculating. But yeah, I just think it's so amazing. I mean, even the original thing that you can take a, you know, a skin cell and turn it into an embryonic stem cell, and just, we always think of you know, this time zero, like this is one direction. Cells are going to only move, you know, what we consider this landscape in terms of their states, and they can only go from this state to that state. The idea that it can go back, I think, is amazing. And I think just understanding how that process works. And then the other thing we're really interested in is what are the features of this programmed cell? Like, does it truly look like a young cell? Or is it a totally different type of cell that in nature maybe we haven't even seen? And what does that mean for how it's going to function and totally. respond? The yeah. questions I have in my mind are, OK, well, you take this, you know, 40-year-old skin cell, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. and let's say you're going to completely reprogram it to a stem cell and your epigenetic age goes back. Um, but, like, 
what happens to all the damaged mitochondria? Yeah. Are they still there? <laughs> like, what about the pieces of DNA that, you know, like, is that stuff still there? Like, where does it go? I mean, How does it go yeah. away if it does? The exciting thing is actually the mitochondria seems to also be kind of rejuvenated if, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't really like the term rejuvenated, but it seems to be kind of set back to okay. a better functioning state. Oh, really? And, yeah, again, it's not clear how all these things are linked to each other. I think the other question, though, is, you know, cells also build up kind of these aggregates and other, you know, nasty <laughs> kind of byproducts and accumulate. What happens to them? I don't think right. we know that. Um, yeah. But it's an important thing, I think, to figure out. So, I mean, if the epigenetic clock, let's, you know, because it's, you know, controlling gene expression, um, you know, it's like, well, maybe the, my, the nuclear encoded co um, mitochondrial proteins, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe everything's just yeah. bouncing back to how it was. And so you're, you're yeah. making, you know, you're building better mitochondria, right? I mean. Yeah, I have some, I have some colleagues who would argue that it starts with the mitochondria getting rejuvenated and then that's how everything else. But yeah. I think yeah, we, it's we back to that hallmarks that of aging. You know, mitochondrial dysfunction is what's one, first. You know? Yeah, I mean, and or as you mentioned, it's probably not just one thing. It's a combination yeah. of all these these factors together combined, mm -hmm. where your proteins are misfolding and your mitochondria are dysfunctioning and your mm -hmm. you know your DNA damage is accumulating. And so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's a fascinating area. And the programming part, like, it's just I, I was just curious what your thoughts are in terms of the basic. Science, like, what does that yeah. mean to me? It's kind of it, it, it goes back to again that program. Like, there's something yeah. going on we don't quite understand, but it's something. <laughs> yeah, this comes back to this whole idea that I I don't think what we see with aging is just random stochastic damage or errors. I think we've always saw, thought of aging as just this accumulation of errors, but it really might just be a program that kind of goes wrong, and there's nothing evolutionarily that needs to prevent it from doing that because it doesn't benefit, you know, fitness to prevent that program from going wrong. Um, but the idea that it can be reprogrammed, again, using the operating system kind of analogy that you can just take an, you know, operating system that's not doing well and do an update and take it back to this better state. And again, we need to figure out exactly what that means. But right. I, I think it's really exciting. It is, and it's certainly, like, there's no doubt that accumulation of damage does play a role in aging, but, mm -hmm. like, maybe it's not the cause or the only thing. Yeah. Maybe it's Maybe it's just the feed-forward loop accelerating it. Who yeah, knows, right? Exactly. I mean, it's, it is. It's, all, it's also interesting.